What is the value of a soul? What is the value of our souls? Can we even put a value on the soul? That's one of the questions we're going to be dealing with today as we focus today on Leviticus chapter 25 to 27. We're looking at chapter 27. Very interesting. My name is Rod Embry. And I'm Jen. This is Bible Discovery TV as we focus on all of these things. Corey, what's up? Well, I'm going to be taking a look at the first few verses of Leviticus chapter 26, which is a regulation against idolatry. More on that later. Ryan, how about you? Well, guys, today I want to talk about the sanctity of human life. And to do that, we're going to examine what it means to be biblically alive. Okay, biblically alive. So that's going to be good. We got Corey, look forward to that, Ryan, as well. What did you do, Jim? I'm going to talk about living with purpose. All right, living with purpose. So get your Bible out and open up to today's particular passage. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter 27 and let's listen to what God is saying. Leviticus 27, verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation, if your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if from five years old up to 20 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to five years old, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels of silver and for a female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. But if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for him, according to the ability of him who vowed the priest shall value him. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. Leviticus chapter 25 to 27, that's what we're reading today. And we're going to stop and we're going to focus on chapter 27 because this is, again, a fascinating discovery. Now, do we read the Bible to discover its true intent and meaning? Do we? Or are we satisfied with what it sounds like to us? We have all experienced the frustration of being misunderstood, haven't you? I have. Well, the Bible can also be misunderstood. So we must really strive to get the heart of the biblical passage rather than assume that we understand it and, and we understand it from a quick read. Clearly, the Bible does not place a price on souls because every soul is priceless. But God proclaims that he is the creator of all life and that life is beyond physical value. Life is beyond physical value. Banks, know that. What is upsetting and what causes us to value others unequally are decisions that we make as human beings. Our decisions always affect the people around us, even when we can't see it. And this is the point that God makes in the Bible. God's judgments are about right and wrong for the Israelites, and they take all of this in mind. The ultimate value of human life, the consequences of sin against him, and its effects on others. Now, this is really something to discover in the midst of Leviticus, but that's exactly right. Chapter 27 is fascinating because a lot of people look at this and just read it and they, they say, well, yeah, well, that's no good. God's just putting prices on people and slaves. and everything. No, 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 no. There's something else going on here. The priests are involved. There's other things going on here. So let's take a look at it carefully. Now take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. The Bible is the most important book ever. 
ever, ever written, ever read 66 books by 40 authors over 1,500 years, 1,500 years, and it has the same theme, Jesus Christ. If you turn your Bible guide to today's passage, if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? Use the address at the bottom and write for yours or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com will click on the page of the Bible guide. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you so much for your donations. We greatly appreciate them. They really help us. So thank you so much for that. And we're going to look at today the value of the soul. I mean, how do you... I mean, think about this. How do you place a value on a human being? You, you, can't, you can't say, well, he's worth 20 bucks. And the bank says, I'm worth so much because that's what I'll make. No, no. God says, no, that's not true. And Father, I pray today as we look at the value of souls, as we try to understand what the Bible says, help us to hear you. Because Lord, it's really easy for us to quickly get the idea and assign things, but help us to realize that's where people make mistakes. And they assign the wrong. They misunderstand you, Lord. We don't want to misunderstand you. So help us to see the truth about what you're saying. There's several things going on here. And in Jesus' name, we said together, amen. Now, 27th chapter of Leviticus, verse 1. Seven verses here. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates or sets himself apart by a vow, certain persons to the Lord. When a man consecrates himself by a vow, certain persons to the Lord, according to your valuation. Okay, that's very important to hear that. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old and up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. That's interesting. Verse four says, if it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if it is from a five-year-old up to a 20-year-old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old to five years old, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels of silver. And for a female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. And if from 60 years old and above, if a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. Now, what does this mean? People are going to jump on this. Well, what are you, men and women, are, hold on a minute. God spoke to Moses about the assessments regarding the redemptive value of persons. God sees people differently than we do. God said, your valuation, how do you see? And the women did not make the kinds of decisions that the men did. So that's what the valuation was representing. It was not representing the value of their soul. It was representing how we placed it on them. So it's very important. Now look at verse eight, because this is good. But if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself, look at this, before the priest. And the priest shall set a value for him. Did you see that? According to the ability of him who vowed, the priest shall value him. If you don't know what the value is, then you go to the priest. God instructs the priest to value a person according to God's worth. See, God chooses spiritual leadership to represent him. Pastors, you're a chosen leader. You represent God. Very important. Very important. You know, we don't just say things and do things because we feel like it. We study the word of God. We look at the Bible, the 66 books, 40 authors over 1,500 years, and we consider what God is saying because that's what the Lord tells us to do. Now then, look at this, 27 verse 8. But if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself before the priest and the priest shall set a value for him according to the ability of him who vowed, the priest shall value him. Now, this again is something, this is the same verse, two points. The priest is to trust God 
in consideration of the man's value. God is very much a part of this. God will hold us accountable for how we place meaning on another person. And so, beloved, this two points from one verse, very important to remember because there's a lot going on here. And God tells us, he says, the priest should be the one who accesses me, who knows what I think, knows how I feel. So you can't just take the Bible and what it says and say, well, God says that. No, no, hold on a minute. God is setting his value according to the decisions we make. And beloved, let me tell you something today. It's very important that when we accept Jesus Christ, we become eternal beings, beings that do not have our value based. Or the bank says you're worth so much and I'm worth so much and all of that. But let me tell you something. The banks have nothing on God, nothing. See, God doesn't use money. He doesn't need money. He owns everything. He, does, he owns everything. He doesn't need money. So beloved, we must understand that. Now we use money, of course, to do things like this ministry uses money to pay for the electric and all that. But God teaches us the true meaning of values of souls. As we seek the Lord and look at him, he shows us the truth about us. Well, it's time now to continue on with our Bible study, and today we're continuing our reading through Leviticus. And one of the common themes we see throughout this book is the sanctity of life, particularly human life. And this is what I really want to focus on today, because the Bible makes some distinctions regarding life. For example, what is alive in the biblical sense? Well, we already know that blood, according to the Bible, is one of the features of a living thing. But what I want to find out is what other criteria does the Bible give for a living being. In other words, what's considered to be alive according to the Bible? I mean, are plants alive? What about microorganisms or certain types of animals? And does the Bible make distinction between the living animals and humans? Let's study. It's alive, or is it? Actually, much of what's considered alive biologically today isn't necessarily considered alive biblically. For example, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term nephesh cheya, meaning living creature or living soul, is used only to describe vertebrate animals and humans, not plants, not microorganisms, and possibly not even insects. For example, on day three of creation, God brings forth vegetation, plants, and fruit trees, and never once are they described as living creatures. In fact, the Bible elsewhere never talks about plants dying, only withering or fading. Therefore, plants might be better described as self-replicating solar-powered food factories. Similarly, microorganisms, though we are not told when they were created, also do not fall under the biblical category of living things. They too are ingenious biological machines. It's not until Genesis 1.20 that the phrase nephesh cheya is first used, and it's here on day 5 of creation that God creates the living creatures, the nephesh cheya, both of the sea and of the air. Similarly, on day six, God creates the nephesh cheya of the land, both the animals that could be domesticated, the cattle, as well as those that could not be domesticated, the beasts of the earth. Also, God creates the creeping things, which definitely refers to reptiles and amphibians, but may or may not include insects. Indeed, as Dr. Jonathan Sarfati points out, although many insects creep, the Hebrew word remez, meaning creeping things, seems restricted to vertebrate creepers, such as reptiles, not insects. There also seems to be other scriptural hints that insects do not fall under the biblical category of living things. For example, we see in the flood account that all life forms outside the ark that breathe through nostrils perished. Insects and arachnids do not breathe through nostrils, so were not considered nephesh cheya that needed to be saved as obligate passengers on the ark. So insects, like plants and microorganisms, may also be considered ingenious biological machines, though admittedly the Bible does not totally rule out the possibility that they are alive either. 
Nevertheless, the Bible does draw a clear line between the non-living vegetation and the living vertebrate animals and humans. And more importantly, it makes the ultimate distinction which many modern biologists fail to make. That is the distinction between animals and humans. Unlike the animals, only man was created in the image of God and according to his likeness. God breathed life into man and gave him special attributes which are totally unattainable to the animals. As the medieval rabbi Rambam so eloquently put it, man alone among the living creatures is endowed, like his creator, with moral freedom and will. He is capable of knowing and loving God and of holding spiritual communion with him, and man alone can guide his actions in accordance with reason. He is therefore said to have been made in the form and likeness of the Almighty. The Bible makes it absolutely clear that we are not animals, nor did we come from animals, but that we are totally unique and special creations of God. So according to the Bible, there is a big difference between things like plants and microorganisms and living things like vertebrate animals and humans. And as we saw, the Bible also makes a very clear distinction between the living animals and humans. We aren't animals, but we're unique and special creations made in the very image of God. And actually, we're given the responsibility by God to take care of the animals. So what's biologically alive isn't necessarily what's biblically alive, and that's something to keep in mind. When did we ever get to the place where we, we decided to uh, define everything by what we discover rather than define everything by what the Bible says? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question comes in about the early 1800s. Very interesting, yeah. Ryan. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Corey, what's going on now? Right. Okay, so I'm going to be taking a look at the first few verses of Leviticus chapter 26, because here again, we see a prohibition against idolatry in any form. So, you know, it says don't make idols or set up a sacred stone to bow down and worship before it. So keeping it right out of the land, keeping it right out of the culture of Israel. But of course, we know that that didn't happen as, you know, already in the Bible, in Genesis, we've stumbled across idol worship. Remember, Rachel steals her father's uh, household idols when Jacob and her and Leah are leaving. Um, and so we've already seen household idols being a thing in Genesis. We've heard the prohibitions back in Exodus against idols. We get it here again in Leviticus. And as we keep reading, we're gonna see Israel fail uh, to keep this. Uh, but I wanna take a look at the physical record that ancient Israel left behind. Is there examples of idolatry in the land? Take a look. Idols pop up all across the pages of the Old Testament. Their first mention in Genesis is when the matriarch Rachel steals her father's household idols. In case the reader is left with any doubt on where God stands, Jacob orders his household to hand over all of their idols before sacrificing to God at Bethel, a purification process that saw Jacob burying them. In the books of the law, God specifically prohibits the creation and ownership of any sort of idol, but this didn't stop the Israelites from engaging in the practice. Throughout the Bible's historical books, we read of idolatry. Even in the house of King David, anointed by God and loyal in his heart, teraphim, commonly rendered household idols, were found. Archaeology has confirmed the existence of idolatry in ancient Israel and Judah, with the discovery of thousands of clay figurines from nearly all periods of occupation. But while it's confirmed the practice of having these figurines, it has not been able to explain what was actually done with them. The Bible, too, is silent on practices surrounding personal idols. What was their use? Were they symbolic? Were prayers and offerings given to them? Or were they purchased more as good luck charms and tucked away? Just as clay votives could be purchased and given as an offering at a pagan temple, perhaps household idols themselves were purchased at pagan temples and brought back home as a symbol of devotion. No one really knows, and while documents outlining religious practices of various people have been found, no outlines have been found to settle the mystery of household idols. In Israel and Judah, the most popular seemed to have been a female figure, perhaps representing the deity Asherah that's mentioned in the Bible. 
Interestingly, it appears that all attempts to purify the worship of Israel and Judah were never 100% successful until after the return from the Babylonian exile. Despite extensive excavation, no figurine idols from this time period have been found in areas occupied by return Israelites. This is in stark contrast to areas inhabited by other groups. It took an exile, but eventually ancient Israel lived, it seems, in accordance with the first and second commandments. So what we looked at today is only one example, uh, one, one example of a kind of idolatry that was going on in the ancient world. There were also statue idols that were set up in sacred stones and, and um, poles that were set up in high places. And as we continue to read through specifically the historical books of the Bible uh, that were rapidly coming up to as we go through the law, we're going to see more examples of that. But I wanted to focus this, this uh, segment specifically in on those household idols and the smaller idols because it really does show how it had permeated the culture. It wasn't just a place that they went to where they mixed the worship of God with the worship of pagan idols as well. They had integrated it into their lives, which became a really big problem. And we see the prophets, you know, speaking against this. So this is just something to keep in mind as we continue moving forward. It's all it's it's always uh, really informative to know what was going on in the culture and and how that was breaking the covenant of God. So right here we already have an example of how this cultural element is just going to continue to fester, unfortunately, in ancient Israel. But it's very interesting. I hope you caught at the end of the segment there. Uh, very interesting that at the time of the return from the Babylonian exile, because only people who wanted to return from Babylon actually did come back to Jerusalem, that these types of idols are, are just systematically not found uh, in those areas known to have been inhabited by returned exiles, which is really interesting. It is. And remember when uh, Jacob uh, was coming back to see his brother and all of that, and God said, get rid of all your idols. Yeah. And so it's the kind, same kind of thing after the exile, when they come back, not everybody came. But it's like when they came yeah. back to Jerusalem, God yeah. said, yeah, get rid of all your idols. I yeah. find that fascinating. Yeah, and, and we see a really radical commitment. You know, when we get into Ezra and Nehemiah, we're going to see a radical commitment that was enforced by, you know, for better or for worse, by some of the leadership. So it's, it's going to be really interesting as we go through to see this progression of a covenant made, a covenant lost, and then a covenant reformed. It's amazing. It really is. Mm -hmm. Well, Janice... Yes, you know, this chapter 27, redeeming persons and property dedicated to God. Sometimes when we read it, I remember as you were uh, taping the teaching sections and you know, you mentioned all, oh, as I read this, some of you are gonna, I don't know if you use the word, gonna get your hackles up, but that was kind of what I thought. Oh, some people, when they begin to hear this, might think, what are we talking about? Are we talking right. about that a male is more valuable than a female or right. that this and, and that? And because that's where our culture at this time and where our go. minds yeah. take us, where we are so overly politically correct sometimes that we're mm -hmm. afraid to speak anything. And so the question is then, what is the value of a soul? What does God think of us and how does he value us? And yet we learn from Genesis the very fact that we are created in his image, male and female. We are created in God's image. And this is redeeming persons. It says here, when a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord, in the same way we consecrate ourselves when we decide that we want to give our lives. When we come to the point in our life when we believe what God says, that he sent his only son into this world with the sole purpose of giving his life on the cross to shed his blood to be the final finishing fulfillment the final sacrifice because only he could do that only he was fully god and fully man perfect in every way he was the only one that could pay that cost and in giving our lives to him his blood cleanses us from our sins when god looks upon us now he sees christ crucified. He sees the blood that was shed for us, making us clean and whole. So this is our consecration, if you would. This is our vow to the Lord. So now as we follow God, 
we have a life of purpose. Now we understand that our value comes through serving the Lord Jesus Christ, who literally gave himself for us. And so it becomes not about the rules and the regulations, but it comes through the understanding of how God wants us to live and to move and to have our being, because it's so easy to get caught up in the trappings of this world where your truth is your truth and my truth and my truth. And God says, no, this is the truth and you need to follow me. So that is to me, what living with purpose really is. And when we, and I'm speaking to believers, to those who say, yes, I have given my life to Christ and I'm going to follow him. That's what we need to do. And sometimes we get out of line, just like sheep with a shepherd mm -hmm. and he brings you back in. And that's Psalm 23. If you've never read that before, it's talking about God as our good shepherd. And we like sheep, we're led astray, but God keeps us in that fold as long as we follow him. And that's what our heart's desire needs to be, brothers and sisters, that we seek God first. We seek God first and his ways. The way we will know that is by reading his word, spending time with him in prayer and listening to God as he speaks to us through his word and obeying that word. Are, am I saying that we have to do everything that the Old Testament says? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that word. And Jesus said, if you are my disciples, you will obey my commands. That's in the New Testament and that is Jesus. And when we do, my goodness, he's with us all the time. You know, I love my sister, Robin. She is amazing. But there were times in my life when I was younger, when we were competitive and I didn't think she was very valuable. <laughs> but I was wrong. The Lord was right. And so today we have to pray because I love my sister. And we say, Lord, help me to see my family and help me to see my friends as you do, God, not as humans do. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, Amen.